So I'm going to talk to you today about Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah. And it says in Leviticus 23, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of remembrance, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Not a whole lot of detail, right, for the holiday. <clears throat> but the rabbis add quite a lot of things and we'll go through them. So this holiday has quite a lot of names, just like many of the other holidays we'll go through the next couple of days. So Yom Teruah actually means the day of blowing or the day of shouting. So Teruah comes from the Hebrew word Ro'ah, which means to raise a shout. So you don't have to have a shofar to raise a shout. You can raise a shout with your own voice. It is generally done in a battle cry or shouting for joy or to sound an alarm or to make a joyful noise. So Psalm 89.15 says, Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. So the Teruah is one of the four kinds of blasts. And I'll put a video, a little quickie video at the end where you'll see my husband blowing the shofar. Um, to kind of illustrate to you these four blasts, which I'll talk about in a little bit. So this holiday is also called Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah means head of the year. Rosh means head. Hashanah is the year. So literally head of the year. So for those of you who know your Bible, how did we get from Nisan, from Passover time, when God says this is the beginning of the year of the months for you, to understanding how this time of year, the seventh month, is actually the beginning of the months? So the rabbis say that Teruah, Rome Teruah corresponds to the sixth day of creation, which I put in your papers, when God actually made mankind. So this was when the earth was finally given its context and its purpose. So in Job 38, 4-7 it says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who has stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fashioned? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all of the sons of God shouted for joy. So the rabbis make the connection between the teruah, between the shouting of joy, and as Job talks about when God laid the foundations of the earth. So in Ezekiel 40 verse 1, it says in the 25th of the year of our captivity at the beginning of the year on the 10th day of the month. So how do you get the beginning of the year being the 10th day? Right? You ever thought about that? If you've ever read this verse, how do you get the beginning of the year and the 10th day of the month? So the rabbis explain this, although there are many different interpretations regarding this particular verse. They actually say that this, in the time of Ezekiel, was responding to a jubilee year. And therefore, when someone goes free, is as though it's their beginning. Well, the Jubilee only begins at Yom, Tr Yom Kippur time. So the rabbis attribute that this is referring um, to the beginning of the year. So Judaism has different new years, just like we do in English. We have a fiscal year in April. We have a school year in August, September, depending on where you live. We have a regular new year. So there's many different new years, quote unquote. So Judaism has the same thing. Uh, in, Ju in Nisan, number one, the beginning of Nisan, which is in April time for us, is the counting of months for the calendar. So this is considered the beginning of the biblical calendar. The counting of the year of the reign of kings is also done at this time. Elul 1, which we just had, is generally in August time, and it's the new year for the tithing of animals. Uh, Shabbat 15, which is in February, is the new year for trees and determining when fruits can be eaten because the Bible says you have to wait for three years before you can eat the fruit of the tree. How many of you knew that? Okay. Well, the rabbis also talk about, I'll give you a little nugget here related to that, that they also relate this to children. So if you ever see in Israel or pictures of young toddlers who are from an Orthodox or religious family, you'll notice that the children's hair, whether they be boy or girls, are very long. Because the rabbis attribute this verse to children as well, saying you cannot cut the hair of the child until they're three. So if there's a big party and whatever. 
So Tishri 1, which is what we're doing now, is the new year for years, as in the counting of years, and this is re regarding the sabbatical years, the jubilee years, um, and uh, to commemorate creation, so often it is referred to Nisan as the biblical calendar year, and this is going to be the secular calendar, not secular as in not divine, but secular as in because it's creation, it involves everybody, Israel and all the nations. So in Exodus it says, And you shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat and harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Sukkot doesn't mark the end of the year, as it will be about six months until Passover's time. So in the first century, Josephus stated that while Moses appointed Nisan as the first month for festivals, the commencement of the year for everything relating to divine worship, but for selling and buying and ordinary efforts and, and Affairs, he preserved the ancient order, i.e., the beginning of the year, beginning with Tishri. Uh, archaeologists in the Old Testament professor Edwin Thiele concluded that starting in Aviv 1, or Nisan, while the southern kingdom of Judah counted years using the civil new year beginning at Tishri, the practice of the kingdom of Judah was also that of Babylon, as well as other countries in the region, to um, begin in the Assam. So as you can see, as Israel separated, there was a discrepancy between when they, they observed as well. So Yom HaZikaron is another name for this holiday. So we've got Yom Tura, we've got Rosh Hashanah, now we're going to come to Yom HaZikaron, which means the Day of Remembrance. So what exactly are we supposed to be remembering on this holiday? The creation of the world, number one. And number two, which is really important, is the binding of Isaac in the Akedah. So this particular story and Torah portion is read in the middle, because we're not at this time, we're in the middle of Deuteronomy in the Torah portion readings, because the Jewish people read a different portion all throughout the year. So even though we're in the middle of Deuteronomy, we pause the portion that we're on to insert a new portion. And so on this time, we read Genesis 22 and the Akedah and the binding of Isaac. Why? Because Isaac and the ram caught in the thicket, right? So it makes obvious sense, right? Mm -hmm. So Isaac, as we know, is a shadow of the Messiah. Very important. I'll give you a couple little nuggets, but there are quite a few of them. Isaac and Yeshua were both born miraculously. Both were only begotten sons, as it says in the actual text. Both were to be sacrificed by their father on Mount Moriah. Both... In both stories, there were three days going up the mountain and three days when Yeshua was in um, the earth. Both willing to took up the means of their execution stake. Isaac, if you remember, carried the wood up the mountain and Yeshua carried his execution stake. The first occurrence of the word love, ahava in Hebrew, actually appears in this portion in Genesis 22 too. That is a very big deal. Every time you see the Hebrew word appear for the first time, it gives you an insight into what the intention by God is for that verse whenever you see it later on. So, uh, this is very clearly a picture of John 3.16, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So that's the connection that's being made there. So it is said that the shofar blown on Mount Sinai when the Torah was given came from the ram which had been sacrificed in place of Isaac. The left horn was blown for the shofar at Mount Sinai, and its right horn would be blown to herald the coming of the Messiah. The right horn was larger than that of the left, and thus concerning the days of Messiah, it is written, on that day a great shofar will be blown. Rabbi Judah says that when the sword touched Isaac's throat, his soul flew clean out of his body. And when he, God, let his voice um, be heard from between the cherubim, lay not thy hand upon the lad, the lad's soul was returned to his body. So when his father unbound him and Isaac rose, knowing that in this way the dead would come back to life in the future, whereupon he began to recite, Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead, which is part of uh, the Amidah prayer we do every Shabbat. 
and all the days of the week too, the Jewish people do. So isn't that interesting how the rabbis basically say that his soul left his body and then came back. So in a way, Isaac is resurrected just like Messiah would be resurrected. So by virtue of Isaac, who was offered as a sacrifice on top of the altar, the Holy One, blessed be he, will resurrect the dead in the future. As it is said in Psalms, to hear the groaning of him who is bound, to open the release for the offspring appointed to death. So, sorry, I lost my word. Him who is bound is interpreted as Isaac upon the altar. To open the release for the offspring appointed to death is interpreted as the dead whose graves the Holy One, blessed be, will open up, and he may set them on their feet in the Olam Haba in the world to come. So the dead of Messiah will rise as he returns on Yom Teruah, as it is said, very famously, in 1 Thessalonians, but I do not want you to be ignorant. You guys can read with me. Brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if you believe that Yeshua died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who fall asleep in Yeshua. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead of Messiah will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Hallelujah. Amen. So, the next thing we are reminded of is to herald the coming of the Messiah. Shouts of joy were preceded at uh, Messiah's conception as it says in Luke verse 1, 41 and 42. Shouts of joy were at Messiah's birth, Luke chapter 2. Shouts of joy at Messiah's resurrection in John 20 and Luke 24. And shouts of joy at Messiah's return in Exodus 19, Revelation 1 and 4. So in the tradition of early Judaism, when a, bride went to, when a bridegroom went to claim his bride, they would blow the shofar and say, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. That's tradition. So, the next thing we are reminded of is to repent, which is a big point of the whole holidays that I mentioned to you uh, the other day. Shofar is from the Hebrew word shafar. So, shofar on the top here, shafar here in the middle, is the root of that word, and it means to beautify. The connotation is something that is going to be changed to be more beautiful, just like when we put on makeup or adorns herself with jewelry, it's a way to make something more beautiful. So the first time that Shafar is used in the Bible is in the giving uh, of the blessing by Naphtali, uh, by Jacob to Naphtali, which says Naphtali is a deer that is sent out and gives forth beautiful words. We understand that all these prophecies have bigger connotation than even what's written here. So for us as believers, what we can see from this is that the words that Naphtali would speak to the world would be transformative. They would help themselves to beautify, to edify, to change themselves in some way. So God wants to remind us that the shofar, symbolic of his voice, gives forth words that transforms and beautifies our souls. Amen? So we too can be a shofar for God, as it says in Isaiah 52, 7, how beautiful on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, brings good tidings, proclaiming salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So just like Naphtali, we need to have hind feet in high places and declare the good news of Messiah. Amen? Amen. This also reminds me of Psalm 16, 6, which says, The territory has fallen to me with pleasant places. Also the inheritance I have is beautiful. That is such an awesome phrase. That should make you all super excited as believers because the inheritance we have in Yeshua is beautiful. Amen? Amen. May it be so for Scott and his family as well. So the root of shafar is also related to another Hebrew word. Go back here. Shaperu. And actually it was funny because it never occurred to me. I'll tell you something personal here. I'm off book. Um... 
the matron of honor at my wedding and my good friend my whole life long. We had the same birthday, December 22nd, and we shared our birthday almost all my life. She was a teacher in the school I went to, a messianic school. So she was much older than I was, but she was uh, a good friend to me all, all the years of my life. We were in dance ministry together, and she was a matron of honor at my wedding. Uh, she passed away right before Rosh Hashanah. It never occurred to me, so I was making the slides for you guys, that Shapiro can be read Shapiro if you take the vowels, because the vowels don't matter in Hebrew, only the consonants matter. So if you change the vowels, it can be Shapiro, which was her last name. It never occurred to me that in all the years that she had ministered to me as a person, and she had a gift of mercy, there are so few people in this world who have the gift of mercy. And she was one of those people. And um, anyway, and so it never occurred to me that God used her to be a shofar, to beautify every person around her. And if you knew her, you'd understand what I meant. And so I just, I was thinking about that earlier. And then when I got here, I got the text that Rabbi Sekula had passed away. And so I was thinking about my friend who had passed away and Rabbi Sekulo who had passed away. And may they and us both be Shapiro for the word of God. Amen? So, Shapiro means to amend. It's a different form. Just like I was saying before, to beautify. So Shapiro means to amend something, to, to beautify it in that way. So the rabbis say that in this month, the month of Tishri, you shall amend your deed. The Holy One, blessed be He, said to Israel, If you amend your deeds, I shall become unto you like a shofar, as the shofar takes in the breath at one end and sends it out on the other. So I will rise from the throne of judgment and sit upon the throne of mercy, and I will impart to you the attribute of justice into the attribute of mercy. How awesome is God? So as we turn to God and amend our ways, we ultimately beautify our souls in repentance. The shofar calls us forth to repentance to beautify the bride of Messiah in righteousness. This actually reminds me of Queen Esther. When she was asked what jewels she should get to appear before the king. And you remember her answer. Whatever you want for me to put on, right? She says to the, to the helper, to the eunuch. So when we, as the bride of Messiah, come before Yeshua, he is the helper, the shamash. We will talk about that when we talk about Hanukkah. Yeshua is the helper. He's the one who helps adorn the bride in righteousness. He's the one who beautifies our soul. He's the one who gives us the jewels. Think about that. That's awesome. So Romans 7.7 7 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So when we blow the shofar at the moon's renewal, we are reminded to renew or to improve our actions before God. The shofar reminds us of the admonitions of the prophets to heed God's warning. When I bring the sword of war upon the land, a sentinel blows the shofar and warns the people. Then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. But then he takes warning. Whoever takes warning shall deliver his soul. So when you hear the sound of the trumpet, amend your deeds. The lost will come together. The shofar reminds us of the great and awesome day of judgment and to anticipate it with fear. It makes us yearn for the ingathering of the exiles, as it says in Isaiah 27:13. And it will be on that day a great shofar will be blown, and those who are ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts of Egypt will be gathered one by one for the children of Israel. Listen, there are a lot of people all over the world, and if you don't know a lot about Jewish history and anti-Semitism all over the world, there are still a lot of people all over the world. Jewish people caught in Africa that can't get out because of their governments. Jewish people caught in Russia who can't get out because of their governments. God is going to blow his shofar and bring his people home, as he has promised. 
We are reminded to heed the voice of the Lord. So the first shofar was sounded by God himself. Now Mount Sinai was complete in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of the furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by voice. How awesome. May the Lord answer us by voice this Yom Teruah. Amen. So the voice of God is synonymous with the sound of the trumpet. God also reminds us of his promise to us. As he was the first to blow the shofar with his voice on Mount Sinai, when we blow it back to him, we remind him of his promises to us that he obligated himself to fulfill. He must look upon us favorably because we, people of Israel, can never cease to be a nation before him. That was God's promise, right? So we remind God of the covenant that he made with us on Sinai to be our God and to be our husband, to look upon us and to bless us for good and for life. And praise the Lord, he always fulfills his promises. So what instrument do we sound on this holiday? Here's a picture. Jill, you can be my uh, Vanna White here. And, uh, yeah, you can just open them. So I brought with me two of the shofars. You can see them, two of the, the common ones. You'll see my husband blowing it um, in the video later, in case you've never seen them before. So on on the screen, you can get the other one too in the big bag. So, number one, the shofar has to be keratin, like your nails. A shofar cannot be made of bone. So if you look at it, it's hollow inside. Show them the inside there, you see that hollow. It's hollow inside. And so what they do is they cut off the top, the small bit that's hanging from the, you know, the animal, and they cut it off to where you have that little hole as it starts to, to be keratin all the way through. So the rabbis talk about, since the Bible doesn't mention, which shofars you are allowed to blow and which you are not allowed to blow. So just right off the top of your head, which shofars do you think you're not allowed to blow? What animal do you think would be improper? An unclean animal, very good. One particular animal. Fork. A pig. The pigs don't have horns. Oh, do <laughs> But that would have been true. <laughs> so, uh, there you go. Cow, number one here. All the way on the left there. This is a cow horn. You're not allowed to use a cow horn or any derivative of a cow horn, bison, buffalo, whatever, and that's a derivative of a cow because of the sin of the golden calf. Oh, wow. So you are not allowed to use that. It is considered improper. Hmm. So number two on our picture here is the kudu, which uh, Jill was showing you. This kudu is um, very often found in South Africa, and it's used predominantly by the Yemenite Jewish community uh, that are down there. So this is one you'll see most often because people like the fancy big one. Uh, <laughs> it makes a statement, right? Um, but the different shofars really have more to do with what animals were present in the area you lived than uh, anything else. The number seven here is a ram's horn, which Jill was just showing you, uh, the smaller version. This is obviously the most traditional version because of the ram caught in the thicket. It has the most significance. So even if you're from an Ashkenazi background, from an Eastern European Jewish background, or if you're from a Sephardic Jewish background, a Spanish Jewish background like my husband, they agree both on the same shofar. And if you knew the two communities, you'd know they pretty much don't agree on anything. So that tells you <laughs> the uh, unbroken tradition. So according to the rabbis, there are some mandates on how it has to look. So number one, it cannot be cracked all the way through. If it is cracked all the way through, it is completely useless. You cannot use it for service to God, number one. Two, you cannot adorn it. You will find online shofars that have silver and whatever, bejeweled and bedazzled and whatever. This is not able to be used for this holiday for service to God either. Because if you remember the significance of the ram caught in the thicket and Yeshua being the perfect lamb who was humble and had no adornment, 
you cannot use this as an adornment um, for this holiday. Carving into it is okay, but still, just don't. For this one, just don't. Hmm? For this holiday, does it mean it can be used for other holidays? That's a good question. The gilded one? Any of them that are... Oh, okay. Yeah, well, the there are other ones that are kosher, that they're just from different animals. So, let me continue. So, this one here, number 10, is called a Gams book, and you will find that in Africa, in African communities. This one, according to the modern-day rabbis, can't be used on this holiday, but you can use it on other days. Um, and the reason for that is because if you look at number seven, and you see, or number two, and you see how they are twisted, the rabbis say that we, on this holiday, when we hear the sound of the shofar, are reminded to bend our will to God. So no shofar that isn't bent is allowed to be used. And that's why number 10 wouldn't be even though it is technically kosher. 30% um, of all the harvested horns become shofars. 30%. <laughs> that tells you how much damage happens uh, when they are, are harvesting uh, the animals. And also, as mentioned before, they only use um, the smaller horn, the right horn, because as I mentioned before, the right horn symbolizes the horn that we blow to herald the Messiah. So, Okay, so the trumpet is not a shofar. And this is a confusion in the Bible. And so God bless the translators because they sometimes translate trumpet and shofar as though they are synonymous, but they are not. A trumpet, which is generally a silver trumpet in the, in the Bible, it has a completely different purpose and is only blown by the priests. A shofar, we'll talk about that later, who let, who's allowed to blow the shofar. But it is only a horn from an animal. So, uh, this, they're, not, they're not the same thing, even though we think of them as the same. So the shofars function, there's six of them. One is to announce the Sabbath, a new moon, the Jubilee year. Uh, so it is a regular uh, occurrence. So even though this holiday you are commanded to blow the shofar, and we blow it many times, so it's synonymous with this holiday. But this is a, a thing that you will see all the time, the shofar. It's not like it's a, I hate to say it's not special, but you know what I mean. It's something that you will see commonly. Um, Psalm 81.3 says, blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon and at the full moon are solemn feast days. So we blow it at every new moon. We also blow it for worship, as it says in Psalm 153. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. And in Psalm 98.6, with trumpets and the sound of the shofar, shout joyfully before the King, the Lord. Amen? Amen. Uh, Chronicles 15, 12-15 says, Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God was to be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before God, with a loud voice, with the shouting, and with trumpets and ram's horns. And all of Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with all their soul, and he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. So we blow the shofar to remind us also of the oath that we make before God, uh, to honor him with our lives. And as the Jewish people said, as they stood at the mountain, all the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. And that is our heart's cry for all of us who are believers. Three, to herald the move of the Lord. Um, so, uh, 2 Samuel 6.15 says, So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Next, meeting of the Lord in the air. In Matthew 24, it says, And the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the house, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the heaven to the other. And we read already uh, in Thessalonians, the Lord will catch us up in the air. And in Zephaniah 1.16 describes the day of the Lord. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens quickly. The noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There is mighty men shall cry out. The day of Wrath and day of great trouble, of distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high 
towers. This is why we must remember Yeshua is charged to repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So when we hear the shofar, we are reminded of the kingdom promise God gave us. It is also to remind us as a call to battle. This is a very important one. Nehemiah, one of my favorite verses. Okay, every one of the builders had his sword girded at his side as he built. You remember I was telling you last time that when they were building the tabernacle, the temple of God, there were Jews who didn't want them to build the tabernacle of God. So the men had to have a sword on one side and a shofar on the other. Think about that. How horrible is that? How many people do we know today don't want us to build up the house of God? That's the devil for real. Then I said to the nobles and the rulers and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated far from each other on the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there, our God will fight for us. Amen? So wherever you are standing on the wall interceding, God will fight for you. When you hear that sound of the trumpet, you know that God has rallied to you. Amen. So Jeremiah also says, 419, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My soul, my heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, O oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Most famously, remember Joshua in the Battle of Jericho, right? Who marched around and then blew the sound of the trumpet. And then the city fell down flat. And actually, they say, if you, which is pretty interesting. See, God, amazing. He knows everything. We can't possibly understand. But the way that they constructed Jericho, it was susceptible to sound waves. Sound waves were very powerful. People don't know. So as they marched and marched and marched and stomped in the ground, they literally shook the foundations of the earth. You couldn't see it. And then when they blew the shofar and the sound waves rang out, it crumbled. The whole place. And if you look at the ruins, you remember uh, Rahab, right? Who said, okay, save me and, you know, I'll give you, remember, she was a spy to them. And if you look, you'll see that there's one section of Jericho that isn't destroyed, that didn't fall down. Anyway, they believe this was Rahab's house. Anywho. So, God sends confusion into the camp of the enemy. Hallelujah. In Judges 7, 17 through 22, and he said to them, Look to me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, and all who are with me, then you who also blow the trumpets on every side, the whole camp shall say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So you remember, Gideon and his uh, troops were outnumbered significantly. So he gave everybody a shofar, which normally wouldn't have been done, only the person who was leading the charge, just kind of like well, how we have a little drummer boy <laughs> type of thing. Um, everybody got a shofar, and so they got on this ridge and they blew the shofar, and it scared the heck out of everybody who was down in that valley because they thought literally that there were thousands of people who were coming out against them. And the sound, yeah, the echo, uh, would have freaked anybody out. So, anyway, God gave them the victory. So in the Talmud, Rabbi Yitzchak said, if the shofar is not sounded at the beginning of the new year, Rosh Hashanah, evil will befall at the end of it. Why? Because Hasatan, the adversary, has not been confused. Super important uh, phrase. So Rashi, another rabbi, a famous rabbi after, explained that to confuse him, Satan, means that he will not accuse us. When the people of Israel hear the sound of the shofar, the people of Israel cherish all the commandments of God, leaving Satan with nothing to say. Amen. So when we hear the sound of the shofar, we know that God is doing battle on our behalf. That his voice quiets every voice of the enemy in our lives. How important is that? So who and when can the shofar be blown? So, without getting too deep, the rabbis say that you cannot bring something from the private domain into the public domain on the Sabbath. So typically, the, the, on the Sabbath, 
even though there are injunctions, they are postponed, so to speak. So the shofar is not traditionally blown um, on the Sabbath. My husband and I do not agree with this tradition. And so we blow the shofar every Shabbat. Um, it is important to rout out the enemy. And so that is what we do. So there are some traditions where they do it and some where they don't. But anyway, I just wanted to make that aware because if you ever encounter Jewish people or you ever go into a synagogue and you don't see it, you'll understand why you don't see it. Uh, so, since the shofar symbolizes the voice of God, only someone who is righteous within the community can have the honor of blowing the shofar. Only males blow the shofar. I know I'm going to get myself into a thing with the ladies, okay? But I don't care. Only males blow the shofar. Just because women can do everything a man can do, does it mean we should? Okay? I agree. So, you know, this is, this is a really important principle. And even the people who use Deborah, who was an amazing woman of God, even the people who use her as an example, for feminism, which I am not a feminist, okay? For feminism, uh, misunderstand one very, very important thing she said in the midst of all that she did one of my favorite verses, and she said, my heart is for Israel's princes. She was in the position she was in because the men of God did not take their place. Her heart was to see the men of God take their place. And the women of God who love the Lord need to have the same spirit of Deborah. We should want the men of God to take their place. It does not diminish us in any way, shape, or form. It bolsters the community of God for everybody to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. My rabbi growing up, Rabbi Neil, a blessed memory because he's with the Lord now, used to say that a congregation gets its spirituality from the women and its strength from the men. Part of the reason we have so many problems in the world today is because the men are not serving in the church. Period. Blowing the shofar is given to men because men go to war. Nowhere in the Bible do you see women going to war. What the women do, if the Bible says, is they all rejoice after you come back. And all the women went out dancing, and all the women went out dancing, and all the women went out dancing, okay, over and over again. The women are not prescribed to go to war. When God takes the census of the people of Israel, when they are supposed to go to war, he does not count the women. So if the shofar is being used as a call to assembly, as a call to worship, to invite the people, as a call to war, to announce the next day, whatever, holiday, so forth, these are positions that are taken by men in the community. Please, if there's no man in your community, you can make provisions, but that is not God's ideal version for us to be in a community where there are no righteous men. Even in the story, I don't know why God has me off on this huge tangent. Even in the story of Abraham with Lot, you remember, and God says to them, if there are ten righteous, he goes from a, a hundred to whatever to the whatever, okay? Ten righteous that will save the city. God help us if there are not ten righteous in our congregation. God help us. If I, I see a woman blowing the shofar, what should I do to her? Well, if she's part of your community, then you, you know, uh, you should have another woman instruct her in the right way to do it. If she's not part of your community, then it's kind of one of those, I mean, you should have a conversation maybe privately with her, you know, or your wife or whatever, to let her know why you feel the way that you do, or what is traditional or whatever. Um, but unfortunately, there are communities that allow it. Um, ours isn't one of them. <laughs> Don't show up with your shofar, okay? <laughs> um, yeah, I've been to other Messianic congregations, so it's not just, you know, not just us. Listen, there's other things we don't allow women to do in our congregation, too. We don't allow women to wear talits. Uh, if you've ever been to a Jewish community, you know, a prayer shawl, okay? Women are not wearing this in our community. I got flack one year. 
because you know when it comes to Simcha Torah and you march the Torah around the synagogue and it's a very joyous time and normally you pass it from one person to the next, whatever. And uh, I told women that they couldn't carry the Torah. I got some flack for that one year. I don't care. I don't answer to you. I answer to Hashem. The end. So, anyways, <laughs> I don't know why God had me on that tangent. That's for somebody. Well, let me ask. So. I can't think of his name. But what about the warrior that wouldn't go to war unless this Deborah. woman, Deborah, went yeah. with? What's wrong? Well, well, Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So she did go to war, right? Laura. Technically, she was the general. Yeah. Yeah. But again, that's what I was saying before. So there are provisions when a man isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. Okay. So that a woman can take her place. There, yeah. There's many instances of this, even even uh, in the modern world where we, you know, the women are given the honor to light the candles for the Sabbath, to, to uh, invite the Sabbath, the presence of God into your home on Shabbat. Um, if there are no men, you're not married, I mean, no women rather, you're not married, whatever, then uh, a man can do. So there are provisions where the men and the women can kind of, if there's nobody else present. But if there's nobody present in your congregation to blow the shofar, there's no righteous men there. You better pray somebody in. I'm telling you that much. Right? You better pray them in. Hallelujah. So, um, yeah. Uh... Where am I at now? Okay. So, also, before you blow the shofar, you are recite a prayer. Before you do anything in Judaism, I don't care what it is, you say a prayer. Even the rabbis say you should say at least 100 prayers a day. Okay? Between the, the prayer to eat and the after you eat and the whatever, you, you, you do come pretty close to 100. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, and you'll see I have a video with my husband blowing the shofar, um, and you'll see he, he recites the prayer. So traditionally, you blow over a hundred blasts on uh, Yom Teruah. So there are uh, four blasts that go forth. You have a tekiya, which is a long sound, kind of like, okay? Um, and tekiya comes from taka, which means to blow, to blast, to clap, to thrust as in with a knife, so think about the enemy when you blow your tequila, to drive or as a st uh, uh, Prod. the peg, like Yael, into the head of the scissor, right? Mm. Okay, to drive, you know, the head into the head of the enemy. So Yeshua, as you remember, was driven with nails. So we don't just shout to bring down the enemy, we also do it to affirm the truth of Yeshua, who was nailed on the cross for us. The eternal servant, by whom we are free. So when we blast the tequila, we are reminded the enemy and the finished work of the Messiah, that we are more than conquerors in him. May the Lord enlarge our tents on the head of the enemy. Amen? So the second one is uh, Shwarim. Yeah, okay. The three, there are three broken sounds, so it kind of is meant to sound like a baby crying. It kind of has that, you know, that pentameter to it. So, shvarim comes from shavar, which means broken or to break in pieces. So when the shofar sounds in this way, we are to remind that the enemy's yoke is broken over us. It breaks the darkness to bring forth the light of Yeshua. It is also representative of our brokenness that is needed before a holy God. Teruah, which is the third one, is nine staccato blasts. So kind of, da -da 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 -da. that kind of like, uh, kind of sounds like bullets, <laughs> almost. Um, so Teruah, as I mentioned before, comes from Roah, which means to raise a shout, to give a blast. It can be done in a battle cry, making an alarm, etc. So Tekiah Gadola, which is the last uh, blast, that you blow is basically a regular tekiah, just a lot longer. Um, and this is symbolic in the Bible of the last trump that's going to be sounded before Messiah returns in glory. So there's some traditions and customs. Oh, you know what? Ah. Hello. Here we have two horns that are traditionally blown on the Yom Tura. So here we have the what is called the shofar. This is the ram's horn. And this is 
you remind us of the binding of Isaac, specifically the ram caught in the thicket? Now, this horn is traditionally blown by the Ashkenazi and Sephardi communities. Now, next to that, we have what is called the kudu. Now, this is traditionally blown by the Yemenite community. Now, today, I will sound both of these using the traditional sounds, which is the tekiya, the shvarim, the teruah, and what is called the tekiya gadola. This is the long blast, or rather specifically speaking, the last trump. Please rise. <laughs> Blessed are you, Lord, by the universe who sanctifies his commandments and command us to hear the sound of the shofar. So far, because as I said, it's symbolic of the voice of God. So the injunction in the Bible is not, the command is not to blow the shofar. The command is to hear the shofar blown. That's what's important. It's, it's about hearing the voice of God. So you don't have to blow the shofar yourself. You just need to be in the place of hearing. Uh, so traditionally, when you go to a synagogue, it will be one person that blows. And, uh, and everybody else who listens. So if you come and you visit us, you'll hear my husband blow the shofar about a hundred times. <laughs> um, and we usually say an extra special prayer for his breath. Because <laughs> it gets kind of tiring toward the end there. <laughs> Especially when you're supposed to give that tequila gadola at the end. Um, so as I mentioned before, it's customary, do no work. Do no work. Take off the day, do no work. No ordinary work, no regular work, no laundry, no dishes, no whatever, no work. It is traditional to eat apples and honey on this holiday also, uh, because we are reminded of a sweet new year in the Lord. That's what we want for God to give us. Um, so we also eat round challah. If you've ever seen regular challah, it's like braided and it's kind of like long. Um, but on, on Yom Turo, we use the round challah to remind us that the cycles of God never end. It just keeps going and going and going. And we want God to give us a full life. Amen? So we eat the challah dipped in honey instead of in salt, which is traditional because of the salt covenant in the Bible with the sacrifices. So we dip in honey for a sweet new year. Tashlich is a ritual... Uh, performed in the afternoon on the first day of Rosh Hashanah in the Ashkenazi community and by uh, most Sephardic Jews as well. So prayers are recited near a natural flowing water, a river, or a stream or something. And symbolically, one's sins are cast into the sea. So you get some rocks, some bread, whatever. Okay, and you throw them in there, and that's to remind us that the Lord has washed our sins, right? From the east and from the west, he remembers them no more. Uh, as it says, who is like you, O, Allah, or, o God, who will cast into the sins, uh, into the depths of the sea. That's a rabbinical quote. Isaiah 19, 11, 9 says, They will not injure nor destroy my holy mountain, though the earth shall be full of knowledge as the Lord, as the water cover the sea. So, uh, that's just a tradition to physically kind of Unburden yourself, so to speak. Uh, obviously, all the liturgy that you're going to read is going to be symbolic of the same thing, and that is God who is king on the throne. So that is the main theme 
of Yom Teru aside from blowing the shofar. It's to coronate the king, as I mentioned to you before. So some common greetings for the holiday. And I don't have any water, so it's going to be hard for me to make a sound. So Lashana Tova, which means, you know, good year. Or Lashana Tova, Tikka Tevo. Beticha Temu, which is may you be inscribed and sealed for a good year. Um, uh, Shana Tova Umetucha, which is a good and sweet year. Or Kotvenu, the Sefer Chaim, which is the most important for one of us as believers. And that is inscribe us in the book of life. So as I said, we read the uh, uh, Binding of Isaac story. And we also wear white from Rosh Hashanah all the way through Yom Kippur in services. You don't have to wear white at home. Um, that's just to remind us that though our sins are discarded, they shall be white as snow. So as we're going to come before God and ask for him to forgive our sins and we repent before him, that's what we want to um, to embody. We'll talk more about that on Yom Kippur next time. Um, and men usually wear a long white robe called a kittel. Uh, <laughs> this is a funny story. <laughs> um, it was a couple years ago when Dave and I first got here to Georgia. And in South Florida, there are a lot more Jewish people than here. And so I had David go outside. I wanted to take some pictures of him, you know, holding up the shofar to put on the Facebook page to announce that the holidays were coming and whatever, whatever. And so as he's outside, fully in white, it occurred to me, oh my God, what if one of these neighbors thinks my husband is a Ku Klux Klan? <laughs> so I was like, let's take this picture quick and get out of here. Okay, but anyway. So... <laughs> um, Anyway, so if you see anybody around like that, they're not crazy. They're just going to shul, to services. So, the, um, so finally, the most important thing about this holiday, aside from all the things I mentioned before, is the mention of the Book of Life. So I think I was saying last week that uh, the Book of Life is said to be opened on Yom Teruah, and it will be closed on Yom Kippur. We'll talk more about that later. So it embodies the the uh, the song that says "Sign, Seal, Delivered, I'm Yours." Yeah. So think about that when you think about the holidays. So you're going to be signed. You're going to be in or out of the book on Yom Teruah. You're going to be sealed because the book's going to be closed on Yom Kippur, and you are going to be delivered to the Sukkah to the eternal rest of Yeshua on Sukkot. So think about that. Sign, seal, delivered. So, the first time in the Bible that we see a hint of the mention of the book of life is in Exodus 32 when Moses is talking to God asking him to forgive the sins of the people after the golden calf incident. Remember he went up and down three times? So Moses says, yet now if you forgive their sin, but if not, I pray, blot me out of your book which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. What an amazing thing for Moses to say before God. That if you are not going to forgive this people, that I have spent my whole life working toward to help, then I don't want to do that. That is such an amazing, I don't know, I read the things Moses says and, the Mos and that Moses did. That's why he's called Moshe Rabbeinu in, 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 in Hebrew, because there, there's nobody like Moses besides Yeshua. There's no one like him. I can't even imagine, even as a leader, that, that he would have the heart to not even want the blessings of God if his people couldn't have it too. How awesome is that? May all of our leaders feel the same way. Um, so as we know, the whole generation dies in the wilderness except Joshua and Caleb who bring the good report. So the question is, was God referring to an eternal book of life at the end of days or to an earthly book of life that determined whether a person would live or die on this earth that would be opened and closed every single year? This is a big debate in Judaism. We take a lot of things for granted because we come kind of after the conversations. Uh, but this is a big debate within Judaism. And uh, two main sects of Jews disagreed, the Pharisees and the Essenes. The Pharisees thought that the Book of Life was a temporal thing. It would be opened every year, 
and you're in or you're out. And this was really more about the deeds that you have done during the year. Whether you were good, you weren't good. Um, it is written who's going to buy a house, who's not going to buy a house, who's going to live, and who's going to die. Um, so, you know, thinking about that as uh, Rabbi Scott. But, um, you know, that was their interpretation, that this was a physical uh, thing that would be done yearly all the time. The Essenes disagreed with their interpretation and thought this was an eternal book that would be open once for all time uh, at the time of judgment. So this is the reason that the Pharisees and today's rabbis, which are driven with the Pharisees, are one sect of it. Anyway, we won't get into that. Okay, so they talk about that there are three books on this holiday, the Book of Life, the Book of Death, and the In-Between Book. And that that's basically what's going to, to determine uh, the goings on. So the Pharisees and the modern day rabbis believe that the 10 days, Yamim Noraim, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, is the time when you are to do repentance, to do good deeds, because you want to make sure you're in the book the coming year. So that's really their, their motivation, to be on God's good side, so to speak. Um, but as we know as believers, uh, it's not about your deeds, because your deeds are filthy rags. Amen. It's about Yeshua's deeds. He's the only way we're getting in. So, uh, the Essenes believe that this book was referring to where you would spend eternity and that it wasn't a yearly subscription. Rather, the book was open to allow new members in and to remove others. The only verse in the Old Testament that mentions the phrase, the book of life, in that phrase, is Psalm 69, 28, which says, Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteous. So it's very so all the other verses that are related to being written in or taken out or whatever are kind of never with the phrase the book of life. So they're all kind of a little bit more vague. Isaiah 4, 2 through 3 says, And that day the branch of the Lord, referring to Yeshua, shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and pleasing for those of Israel who have escaped. And it shall come to pass that he who left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy, every one who is recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And so because it keeps referring to people who are living, 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 that's why the rabbis in the Pharisaical sect refer to the book as being for people who are living. But in my opinion, if you go and you read the context of all those sections, they all have an eschatological message behind them, which is why I read the verse before it about Yeshua. So, um, so that's not my, my uh, interpretation. So both of these verses in context seem to indicate an end times book, but here's Daniel, who in my opinion gives the kicker, in chapter 12, 1 through 4, says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as was never before since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, every one who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn Many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal this book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So for me, this is the kicker here. Um, there's no question that if you're saying someone's going to be in the book, and that's going to determine their eternal life, or their eternal to contempt, that seems to be pretty clear. There are other books mentioned in Judaism, the Book of Remembrance, and the Bible does talk many times about your deeds being written in the book. So the rabbis have good argument for their side, but I don't agree. So we can see the parallel from the verse in Daniel very clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which I read before. The dead and Messiah will rise first, right? And the whole thing. So it seems like almost a clear parallel between those two sections of Scripture. So there are many references also to the book of life in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigraphal uh, works um, that, that refer to the book of life being eschatological. We're not going to go into all that. Um, but I wanted to mention it to you because there are quite a lot of references to that. 
So the book of life is referenced eight times in the New Testament, once in Philippians, and seven times in Revelation. So the book of Revelation clearly indicates that it's an end times book, um, and even goes a step further to referring to it as the Lamb's book of life. So Philippians says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel with Clement also, and give the rest of my fellows whose garments, whose names are in the book of life. So he who overcomes, it says in Revelation, shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. That tells you that there are many books. Don't ask me how many. God knows. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Finally, Revelation 5, 1 through 10, I'm going to read this whole thing. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaim with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found who was worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold! The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loosen its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders, stood there a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out in all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures in the Twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I was mentioning to you last week. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and every people and nation. You have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the one who took judgment on himself and decreed that the decree of death that was spoken over us would be null and void in the name of Yeshua and that we would indeed inherit everlasting life. The Lord is awesome. So, we pray for all of our brothers and sisters and all of the people God has brought into our path that they too would have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So as we're coming to that, let's pray. Father God, I ask you, Lord, in the name of Yeshua, the name above all names, there is none like you in the heavens above and the earth below. There is none like you, Father God, in all the earth. Mi kamocha, belimadonai, en kamocha. There is none like you, Father God. There is none like you. You are awesome in all your ways, Father God. And I thank you, Lord, that you ever intercede for us by your Father's side. That we have confidence in you, knowing that you have not forgotten us, you have not forgotten our names, you have not forgotten the number of hairs that are upon each of our heads, you have not forgotten us. You remember us this day for life, for blessing, for peace, for kindness, for righteousness, for justice. I ask you, Father God, that you would remember the people that we know who have not yet come into fullness of your kingdom. Our family members, our friends, our co-workers, and even the people we have yet to meet, Father God, I ask you that you would save with your righteous right hand, that you would answer them, Father God, in their day of trial. I ask you, Lord, that you would meet them where they are, that you would give them Damascus Road experiences with you, Yeshua, that they would hear the Teruah of Adonai blow, sound, and rout the enemy in their lives and say, come. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to me. I thank you, Father God, for drawing each and every one of us on this holiday, Lord. That as we hear the sound of the shofar being blown, we are reminded of the promises that you have given us. That you have given us Yeshua, the Messiah, the ram caught in the heavenly thicket that would be sacrificed on our behalf. 
that we might be the righteousness of God in him. I thank you, Father God, that you are going to minister to us the spirit of repentance, that you are going to minister to us the spirit of righteousness, that we too may stand before the mountain of God and say all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. I thank you, Father God, for submissive spirits, Lord, to submit, to bend our will to the call of Yeshua. I thank you, Father God, for giving us the anointment to build up the house of God with our words, with our deeds, that we may beautify our souls and the soul of the bride of Messiah for the kingdom of heaven. I thank you, Lord, for being with us as we accomplish all these tasks. Amen. Amen.